Welcome to Palkus's Next Gen, the show where we discuss issues related to young Portuguese Americans ranging from 18 years old to 35. Our goal is to ensure that our culture strives by focusing on the achievements of the latest generation, with the hope of discovering their secrets to success and continuing to inspire the Portuguese American community at large. Because in our community, Nosh got next and Nosh got now. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, today we have with us Michael De Silva, who works in biotech. He's uh, originally from Toronto and is working in the United States right now and is a member of Palkus. And we're very excited to hear his insights across the course of this evening about biotech, business, banking, and of course, growing up Portuguese. So welcome to the show today. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me on. And um, yeah, looking forward to the, to the conversation. And could you tell us a little bit about what you do now, just as a basic uh, update for the audience? Yeah, so uh, I'm actually, I just started a job uh, in biotech uh, about four months ago uh, here in the Bay Area in, in San Francisco. Um, I work in finance. It's actually uh, a new graduate program. Um, and uh, they basically put you through uh, a rotational program, which is one year uh, in one type of a role. And then the following year, you'll do something um, completely different, but probably within, within finance. And so uh, right now I'm in financial planning and analysis, um, specifically uh, finance in global supply chain and manufacturing. So uh, that's what I'm doing now, uh, learning, learning a lot about the job because I've never done this before. So uh, every day is a, you know, a learning experience. So it's, it's been really good. Yeah. And you, you want to just sort of give us a little bit about uh, sort of your Portuguese roots and your, your Portuguese background, connection to Portugal, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, um, you know, both my parents were, were born in, in Portugal. Uh, they came to, or they came, yeah, they came to Canada uh, when they were, I think, nine and 13. So um, that's kind of how my connection to Portugal is. And then, you know, growing up in, in a household where, you know, my grandmother lived with us, um, you know, I, I, I learned Portuguese that way. Um, my family was, you know, somewhat connected within the, within the Portuguese community. Um, my parents did come earlier than a lot of uh, immigrants to Canada, uh, in terms of, you know, they were nine and, and 13 years old. So, um, they, they did have a lot of, um, they were very much integrated in Canadian society and, and weren't so much, uh, you know, in all those Portuguese, you know, the festas that they have and all that stuff. So they, we weren't like. Uh, very involved in that, but there was some of it. And, um, but that kind of, you know, piqued my interest in, in, in Portugal and in the Portuguese community. And so I've always been uh, really interested in it. And then, you know, I played soccer most of my life and was very interested in it. And that immediately drew me to, uh, to Portugal and to, to learn the language, the culture, uh, because in Canada, we, it's getting better now, but we never really had a soccer culture. We didn't have clubs we didn't have a you know when the when the world cup was on we weren't cheering for canada you know everyone kind of cheered for their own um you know whether you're italian or portuguese or or greek or whatever you know you had your own background that you cheer for so that's kind of how the the connection for me in the portuguese community started um but really grew a lot when i took my first job out of undergrad uh which was working in a bank um the bank of montreal which is one of the major banks in, in Canada. And um, I got placed at a, a, a branch location in Little Portugal, where I would say 90% of my day was, was speaking Portuguese. So all the clients, all the clients were Portuguese and all of the staff were, were either Portuguese or, or Brazilian. So um, that really uh, helped me, you know, establish some roots and, and uh, master the language and, and learn a lot more about culture, different parts of Portugal, whether it's, you know, the islands, the mainland, um, you know, my family's from the mainland. So learning about other people's um, or, or the, the parts of Portugal that other people came from was also really, uh, really great through that experience at the bank. Well, where in the mainland are your parents from? Yeah, so my mom was born in, in Lisbon. So uh, like right in, right in the city. And then my dad was um, from Povo de Brzezin, so um, a little bit north of Porto. So uh, basically got family, you know, north and south central uh, in, in the mainland. So, um, yeah. 
So I haven't, I haven't actually been to Canada, but if you had to like paint a picture of like what little Portugal looks like, uh, how, how would you, how would you describe it? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. So you have all these little Portuguese, uh, you know, bakeries all over and, and it's one street called Dundas street, but you know, it's branched a little bit more now, but the main area is, is Dundas street. And, um, you know, you have all these little Portuguese bakeries, uh, tailors, um, you know, grocery stores, butchers, uh, bars. And so it really, you know, every business you walk by, it, it, hair, like everything is, uh, you know, Portuguese uh, immigrants that have um, created their business there. Um, and it's, it's really great because, you know, you're walking down the street and you're like, you know what, I feel like having a, a pristled nata today. And so you just walk into Nova Eta Bakery, for example, and, and you have a nata, you have, you know, your, your coffee or whatever. And it brings you back a little bit um, to, to, to Portugal, right, when you're, when you're there. So it, it was really nice working in that community um, because I really got to experience a lot of those things that living outside of Portugal, you don't normally, normally have that right. chance. Andrew, you far, were you far off from, from Little Portugal or no? So I was in Montreal, actually, but I was in Montreal's Little Portugal. Like, that's exactly okay. where I live. Okay. So, like, I very much relate to that experience of outside of that area, you know, it just feels like, you know, regular North American city. But, like, the minute you're there, it's like everything Portuguese is there. You see, like, the little old ladies at the grocery store. Like, everything is just fits into place. It's amazing. But I wanted to ask, actually, building on that, uh, in Toronto, has the population dispersed a little bit? Because I know in Montreal... A lot of them have moved up to the suburbs. So the people who are sustaining a lot of these institutions are getting older. And I personally worry that it's going to go away and that we're going to lose that distinctive neighborhood. Do you, do you have any concerns about that? Yeah, big time. I think um, in, in little Portugal there in, in Toronto, you know, now that I live in the U.S., every time I go back, uh, something's closed. You know, uh, one of the stores have closed, uh, the hairdresser or the travel agency. Um, and... In Toronto, uh, although a lot of them have moved to suburbs, what I've seen is a lot of them have moved from um, one part of the city to a little bit north. Um, just kind of real estate wise, the where the Portuguese community was is, is one of the hottest areas in terms of real estate. Right. So a lot of them kind of just cashed out of that and, and um, you know, moved a little bit north, got a little bit bigger properties, uh, probably helped their kids buy their first home. Um, you know, in that way as well. And so they're still in Toronto and Toronto still got a, a really large Portuguese community in the city. It's just kind of moving from what was traditionally little Portugal um, to an area a little bit more north of the city. But, you know, along the lines of what you were talking about, it is concerning. I mean, the traditions, uh, when we have the Portugal Day Parade, for example, you know, yeah. um, and, and the bank that I was at, we used to be a, a like a, a sponsor of it and, and we used to participate. And I remember being there thinking like all of this, like what's going to happen to all of this when, you know, these people no longer can, uh, you know, put together the, the floats and, and come up with the music and the, the costumes, you know, like, it's just, uh, how are we going to continue this uh, to keep the culture going in, in, in these cities um, when, you know, like a lot of us, probably born in, in Canada or the U S uh, you know, we like it, but we wouldn't necessarily know how to do all the things that, that, you know, these, these people have done for, for decades. So it is definitely something that concerns me for sure. Yeah, and I mean, this is something that like it comes up in a lot of our discussions, like uh, whether it's with next gen or just Palcas as a whole, like um, sort of how, to, you know, how do these conditions like uh, traditions like sort of continue? I think, I mean, and, and I'm just curious, like your opinion, like, I mean, you know, I don't think it's going to just, you know, sort of fall off the face of the earth, but I also think it's just, it's going to look different, you know, maybe than what we grew up, you know, sort of seeing. Um, and obviously like we have a, a big influence and, and role to play in that, but um, yeah, I just, and it, and just from, I know you said sort of the Portuguese roots got you into the, to the bank and everything else. Was it, was finance always something that you were interested in or how did that develop? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. So growing up, I never really had like a, a career um, or a job function, I guess, in mind uh, going through 
well, you know, some people that say I want to be a doctor my whole life. Sure. And I just kind of, for me, it was, I wanted to play soccer. Um, and, and, and I was so focused on that. And, and that kind of led me to, you know, I, I had the opportunity to, to get a scholarship to come to the U S and, and play for university down here. Um, and, you know, at, at that point I was still in my mind, you know, I was thinking, uh, you know, the four critical years, you know, develop myself, maybe soccer is a, is a career that I could, um, I could flourish in. And you get to a point where you realize, um, yeah, you could probably continue playing soccer at some type of a, a competitive level. Uh, but it's probably not going to be a career for you in terms of, you know, you're, you're not going to make a ton of money um, and be able to really sustain the life that you want to live. So that was the real realization point for me. And, and thankfully I was in school at the same time. And so, um, you know, I, I was in a, in business courses and I started to, to look at it a little bit deeper and um, the bank just became like a natural thing for me to, you know, for my first job was to get into um, that type of a professional working environment. And so uh, I remember when I was a kid going into the bank, uh, I used to think like, wow, this is such a, a great place to work. You know, it was, you know, you we went with your parents to the bank and they had their little bank book and whatever. And so when I first thought of career opportunities, I thought, you know, why not a bank? And, and in Canada, banks are, you know, a significant part of the economy and a huge employer uh, in, in, in the city. So had the opportunity and, and applied and, and got the job. And uh, that's kind of what sparked the interest. It was within the bank that I started uh, becoming more interested in um, actual finance, um, investing, um, and the technicalities of, of finance in general. And that's what sparked the interest was once I was in the bank and not necessarily, um, you know, from outside that I was like, I really want to be involved in finance my whole life. So. Gotcha. I'm, I'm excited to, to chat more about, um, about your career and what you're doing now. Um, but I'm curious, like, you know, sort of the recruiting process. I know there's a lot of people out there, you know, like trying to get a college scholarship, that kind of thing, especially for sports. Um, that's kind of huge. So uh, can you sort of walk us through that process? How are you sort of like recruited and did you go check out the colleges and that kind of thing? Just, you know, for people interested. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the team that I played with, or the club that I played with, we didn't, um, you know, Canadian schools don't really offer um, scholarships you know, for, right. for athletics. I think it's starting to change again a little bit. But um, so a lot of the club teams would bring their their teams down to the U.S. to tournaments, and you would play tournaments there, and you'd meet the coaches in person. And and this would be you know when you're a junior in high school, around that time, you know, sophomore, junior in high school, and you start making those connections. Um, the team that I was on in, in the club, we didn't really do that much. And, uh, you know, myself and, and a couple of other of my friends, we had to kind of take that into our own hands. Um, and so we started, uh, you know, we created our first like professional email account. You know, it wasn't like the MSN, um, you know, uh, the original emails that we had. And so we created our own professional emails and we said, OK, now we're going to start reaching out to all these uh, colleges that that we could be interested in. We had no idea whether, you know. The level that we were at if it was going to be if we we're shooting at colleges that were way too high for our level or colleges that you know um weren't going to be able to offer us anything that would that would um, be attractive so we really uh just kind of sprayed out emails to every which way we could um and then we realized as we started hitting responses back you needed to do sats in the us um, so in canada we didn't have sats um and so that was something we had to learn uh, as well um, so we did it a lot harder than what I would recommend. Like if I could do it again, it would be obviously very different. And, and I think that's probably the gist of your question, right? Is sure. uh, how, how do, how can, how can someone do it more effectively? So I would say right away, it's, you know, pre prepare for that SAT test. Uh, so you're not caught off guard because the number one thing, even if you want to play soccer in school is you have to get into school. Right. And so you need to have those admissions and, and, all, all of your grades and, and score test uh, standardized testing scores uh, ready to go. Next, you should have, and it's probably much easier now with all the technology we have, but a, a video of uh, of yourself playing soccer. We we didn't really have that, you know. Um, when I played, I'm only I'm 29 now, but when I was in high school, like the we had like a Motorola flip phone, you know. No one was recording your games on that thing, you know. 
uh, it was camcorders and then getting like getting that onto your computer and editing, like it was just so much more difficult um, then. So now I would recommend, you know, create videos of yourself so you can send, uh, when you send that email to a coach, you would, you know, put your transcripts on there. You would put your SAT scores in a small video clip and say, hey, this is who I am. I'm interested in, in you know, pursuing a, a college career in soccer as well as education. And, uh, you know, let's connect and, and, and here's a little bit about myself, right? And and that's probably the best way to, to get your name out there and, and have success in recruiting. That's great. And, uh, and where did you go, go to college? So undergrad, it was at a college in Illinois called Olivet Nazarene University. Um, so I've actually heard of it. Have you? Yeah, I'm from yeah. Kansas. So like I heard about other Midwestern schools a bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah we played some schools in, in Kansas as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was like it's a small it's a it's a small university, but um, you know it's maybe 45, 50 minutes from Chicago. Uh, so it was like you know well well located, and um, it was nice because it was a place where you could really go in there and, and kind of focus on, on academics and, and uh, athletics. There wasn't too many distractions there. There were, it was uh, quite the strict campus. Um, so it wasn't the traditional, you know, college experience as you guys could probably imagine. Um, but it was a, it was a great experience. I wouldn't trade it for anything. You know, um, I, I made some of my best friends in, in the world there and people that I been in their weddings, um, talked to every single day uh, today. And it all started there, you know, and so those are, those are, those are memories that are going to come with me, you know, all the way to the, to the grave. So it was a, it was the best experience I ever had. And, and I, you know, I, I recommend anyone who's interested in, in sports to try to pursue that at a collegiate level, because uh, the network, the relationships and the memories that you're going to make there are just, um, you, you can't really put it into words, you know. And what position did you play? Yeah, I started off as a, as a midfielder um, and uh, eventually ended up playing a striker for my, I would say my last two and a half years of college. Um, it just kind of worked out that way. We, we had an abundance of people in midfield and, and we were struggling, you know, to score goals. And so the coach thought, you know, let's try, let's try Michael up top and, and see if we can have some success. And luckily, uh, we were, we were pretty successful after that, but, um, yeah, I, I prefer to play forward after learning about it because you don't have to run it's as fun. well in midfield, you know, in midfield, you're running around kind of like a yeah uh, chicken with your head cut off half the time. So, uh, playing I mean, that's, that's kind of what happened to Ronaldo, right? He was on the wing and then gets older, further that's up the pitch up, yeah. and he's, uh, the legs aren't doing it for you. You just kind of go stand up there and <laughs> score the goals. Right. So, what did you, you play, Kayla? Yeah, uh, I was a defensive midfielder mostly, so like holding midfielder. But uh, I don't know. They like to put me in like you know as fullback or something, outside back. That was that was in the days where they said stay home. You know, that don't go forward. So yeah. wasn't as much fun. I watch the kids now. I'm like, if only now I could play. You know. Right. Uh, but anyway. Yeah. yeah. So I'll... you so you came down here for for college. Did you did you end up going back there before getting your MBA, or or did you just stay down here? Yeah, so after after graduating uh, from all of that, I, I moved back to Canada, and that's when I um, was working in the bank there for for about five years. Okay. Um, but I always knew that I wanted to to come down here um, and and work in the U.S. and and the bank I was at had a lot of business in the U.S. and I was hoping to be able to do it that way, um, be able to to have them facilitate the process of coming to the U.S. Um, wasn't possible. And so the next route I thought was to recruit. If I go to a, you know, a, a good MBA school, uh, here in the U S that might help me in terms of getting recruited by uh, U S companies. And so that's kind of what led me to, to SMU or Southern Methodist university. And, um, and then eventually led to this, this career opportunity. So, um, but yeah, I went, went back to Canada, uh, but always had the goal of, of coming back to the side. So you're still doing the graduate program you mentioned, right? So how is the process for applying to that program, like choosing a program to go to? Um, I know a lot of people in undergrad want to do something more, but don't necessarily know how to get there. Yeah, so, so the program's actually, so I've, I've actually graduated from the program, but I'm now in a new hire program at the company. So gotcha. I'm done with school, but for two years, I'm technically in this like 
rotational program at, at work. Um, so just kind of clarify that. But um, in terms of the, yeah, the you know the admission and how, how to go about doing it. So for me, um, I guess I'll walk through how I, I chose Southern Methodist University. Um, so I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big Dallas Cowboys fan. And so uh, every year I was going, I know, I'm sorry, yes. Um, I was going every year down to Dallas to watch, uh, to watch a game and ended up on the campus there because uh, they have a presidential museum. And, you know, uh, I was with a friend and we were just like, you know, it was uh, like five o'clock in the afternoon. Like, what are we going to do? Oh, there's a presidential museum. So we went there. We ended up on SMU's campus uh, and it was really, really nice. Loved it. And, and I really like Dallas uh, in general. It was just like a really nice city, uh, much better weather than Canada. I do not like, oh, yeah. I do not like cold weather at all. Um, another big reason why I wanted to move to the US. And so when I did start thinking about, you know, business schools, I thought, okay, let me look at, you know, I want to look at for good universities, obviously, but uh, in cities that are uh, growing in cities that are attracting uh, big companies that big companies are already there, or where there seems to be a positive trend of economic uh, development. And I think Dallas fit that really well. And, and I could see myself living in Dallas and, and Dallas was or is uh, just a, a city that's just exploding in terms of development. Like if, if you see pictures of Dallas 10 years ago to today, it's completely different. The types of people that are moving into Dallas, the businesses that are moving to Dallas. And um, I thought that that would be a great place to live. And, and, and SMU was really well connected in Dallas, it is really well connected in Dallas. And so that was the first thing that kind of drew me there. And then um, once you kind of identify that, that's, that was the only school I applied to. Um, I knew that's where I wanted to go. And so um, I was set on going there, whether I was going to get in the first year I applied or if I was going to have to wait another year. I wasn't in like a super big rush. Um, but then, yeah, then, then you have to do your, uh, for business school, you have to do your GMAT. Um, and so that's uh, a miserable experience. So you, you have to really prepare for that. Um, and it takes a lot out of you, especially when you're working full time, right? So you work all day and then you come home and you have to study, um, you know, trigonometry and other things that you learned in high school that you never thought would come back up again. <laughs> um, so you had to, yeah, I had to study for that stuff. And then, uh, yeah, you have to sharpen up your resume, right? Uh, bounce it off. I think it's very important to bounce it off um, people that you work with, uh, friends. Try to get as much input as you can uh, because a master's application um, for people who don't know is not just necessarily your grades from undergrad and your test scores, right? They look at your job experience, um, community involvement, uh, they'll do an interview with you, uh, kind of like what we're doing here. I had a Zoom interview. Uh, and then they asked me for little uh, written essays on, on prompts that they gave me, right? So taking all of that holistic uh, approach, use your resources to fine tune that application because it's not just, uh, okay, you had a 3.7 in undergrad, that's great. But if you're, you know, if you don't submit a, a good essay or, or your resume is, you know, not, where it should be in terms of uh, just professionalism, that's going to stick out and it's not going to help you on your application for sure. Yeah. It always comes back to those standardized tests though, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> SATs. Taylor and I did the LSAT, so we, <laughs> we both know that one too well. Yeah. Well, law school is law school's very, uh, very much LSAT based, right? Um, like it, it, for, I had my roommate when I was at SMU was also, uh, he was in law school. He was from Canada, but he was in, in law school at SMU. And, uh, and he, he also was doing his MBA at the same time. And he was saying, he's like, wow. law school is like its own different animal, right? It's very much based on your GPA and uh, LSAT scores yeah. versus I'm, business school is quite different. Yeah, I'm kind of curious, like, obviously having worked in the bank and, you know, getting a scholarship for undergrad, like, and trying to get your MBA, like, as far as, did it ever cross your mind, like, oh, how much debt am I taking on, you know, potentially for, to get your MBA? You know what I mean? Like, I think sometimes, like, like for me, I, I was totally like when I was applying to law schools, for example, I, I had no concept of the amount, amount of debt I was going to rack up. Uh, but I'm sure like obviously being someone who's, you know, close to the money, <laughs> you would see uh, 
uh, you know, that'd be something that you'd be very cognizant of. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious, like, if you, if that ever sort of like um, crossed your mind, and if you, if you have any like tips for anyone who's like considering, you know, taking on, you know, whether it's another degree or just, you know, that initial like undergrad degree, and they don't, you know, they don't have the college scholarship or something like that. Yeah, um, you know, the the that process all came to me at when it came time to the masters, um, because fortunately, you know, uh, for undergrad, I, that wasn't something I had to. Um, really worry about um, as much but when it came to yeah, the MBA it was like okay this is gonna cost me a lot not only am I gonna stop making money you know um, so my entire income stream is is dead um, now you're gonna take on this um, huge amount of debt and so it was a extremely stressful uh, concept to kind of balance with because I was so used to uh, cause I'm a, I'm a really big, like saver, right? So I try to save as much as I can. I like to see, you know, my accounts moving in the direct, in the correct direction and not just like a vacuum sucking all of your cash out. So, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's an important decision because I think, um, again, there's no better investment than an investment in yourself, right? I'm sure, you know, people have probably heard that before and, and you guys obviously know that you're going to, going to law school. Um, but it's a big decision. And so I think you have to really think about it and make sure that it's the right decision at the right time for you. Um, because the last thing you want to do is jump into something like that. Um, get into this program, you've paid all this money and then realize I'm not going to finish this. I don't like this. This is not what I want. Um, then that's really, then that really hurts because that's just not that you didn't really make a smart investment. Right. Um, I think if you know what you want, uh, think about it, you know, before you make that decision, um, make an educate as much of an educated decision as you can possibly make. Obviously things change and there's things that sometimes you can't control, but if you go in and, and make those decisions, knowing, uh, what you want, yeah, it's, it's debt. Um, but it's an investment in yourself and it's something no one will take away from you, um, is your education. And your education will open doors for you for the rest of your life. Um, and so it's very hard now. And it would have been way cheaper for me to do it in, in Canada, to be honest, um, as well, versus here in the US. But I just felt like the doors here in the US, um, the business opportunity is just so much more expansive here that I thought, you know what, it is worth it for me because of what I know I want um, for my life, uh, that I'm willing to take on a significant amount of debt and say, you know what, Let's go for it because I think this is going to pay off. I believe in myself. I know what I want and let's go for it. So once you were completing your program, was there like an on-campus recruiting uh, session that, how did you end up in San Francisco from Texas? Yeah, that, that was very interesting. So uh, how did, I, had, I did an internship. Um, so again, I was in the bank. I had no history in healthcare, pharma, biotech, anything like that. Uh, companies would come to campus uh, to try to recruit, you know, the students. And it was right from the beginning, right. When we started the program, right. Um, there was tons of companies there, you know, constantly contacting us. And, um, so anyways, I ended up working for a healthcare distribution company, um, for my internship. And, uh, so that's kind of my entry point into, um, into bio or healthcare, and then eventually led to, to biotech. And the reason I didn't end up staying with that distribution company, which was in, in Dallas, which my entire idea was go to school in Dallas, stay in, get a job in Dallas, stay in Dallas. It wasn't go to Dallas, then go to San Francisco. You know, um, that was not in the cards at all. But the company, uh, the distribution company, wasn't willing to uh, help me in terms of the immigration process that I needed. Um, and so they had extended me, uh, you know, an offer to stay on. Uh, but they weren't willing to, you know, walk and, and take on the, the process of sponsoring a, a candidate for, you know, an H1B or for, uh, or for a green card. Um, and so I was going to have to work on like a temporary visa. Um, and, but then, you know, along came, and I wasn't even looking for an opportunity, but along came uh, my current employer uh, and they reached out to me and said, Hey, we really saw that you, you had this internship, um, at this healthcare company, we have some people that used to work there. 
they used to be here in the Bay Area before they moved to Texas, and um, we just kind of sparked the interest in your in your resume. I said okay, so they, they reached out to me through through LinkedIn, and, and that's kind of how that started. Um, and then they were just so helpful in terms of um, immigration front; they were super professional, um, and it just really gave me a good feeling about saying this company actually wants me to be here. Um, they're willing to, you know, take on the immigration um, task, I guess you could call it. Um, and, and so that made me feel really good. And that's what brought me up to San Francisco because that was not the intention at all uh, when, when, I went to, when I went to SMU, for sure. So is San Francisco sort of like a, like a hub for, for biotech or is that, am I way off base? <laughs> No, there, there is a bunch of biotech here. Um, certainly it's one of the, especially for like startup biotech companies. There's a lot of smaller ones. Um, and then you have other biotechs that are like in New Jersey, um, in Florida, there are some as well. Uh, but yeah, San Francisco, there is a bunch uh, of biotech companies here. I would say Gilead is probably the biggest one in the Bay Area. And that's where you're at? That's, yeah, that's where I'm at. Um, I think they're the biggest one, but there's a bunch of smaller biotech like startups that are always coming up with like, you know, really great products and treatments and all that kind of stuff. Um, and there's a lot of it here. So uh, for sure, it's, I wouldn't necessarily say it's like the hub, but there's, there's a lot of biotech here for sure. And you mentioned that you work a little bit with like the supply chain side of things. Uh, right now, everyone probably knows that there's, there's been some issues in our overall supply chains for this country. Uh, so what is kind of your outlook and has this presented any real challenges for you at work? Yeah, you know, since I've joined on, I haven't really heard um, much about, in, in terms of our line of business, uh, problems with supply chain, given like the, what, what we're hearing in the news, you know, with like lots of shortages and lots of ships waiting to come into, into port to drop off goods and like uh, things for, for sale. Um, but one thing on, on the supply chain front is, is the company I work for, they, um, they have a drug that was for, or used for, for COVID treatment. So it was called remdesivir. I'm sure oh, you yeah, I've heard of that. Heard of so that was our product. And so on the supply chain, I wasn't here when it happened, but apparently it was just uh, an extremely difficult process of trying to understand where do we need to, like there was, you know, uh, finite resources, the, we couldn't just make it, you know, you could make it as fast as you can, but you don't have that many vials of remdesivir that can kind of go everywhere. And so you're trying to figure out where's the next hotspot going to be of COVID? How do we get the product to the patients that need it? Right. And then at the same time, how do we make sure that, you know, we're taking care, like it's an American company, um, you know, you don't want to kind of ruffle the feathers here in the US either and say, you know, well, we're sending all our product over to, to Europe, right? That wouldn't have gone well at that time, uh, for sure. And so it was just a really complex process of global supply chain. How do you um, kind of predict uh, where these hotspots are gonna pop up? How do you get the, the appropriate uh, product to the right places? And then how do you price it? Um, so that, because it's a, it's a very valuable product, Right. Um, and you got to price it in a certain way that, you know, is right. fair for patients because we're in the middle of a, a global pandemic. Right. So I wasn't there, thankfully, at that time, because those would be very difficult decisions to make. And uh, um, but yeah. So you mentioned you're, you're in sort of like the financial planning and that kind of thing. So I'm curious, like if you have any. Um, so I know you only did four months, but to the extent, you know, you're aware of like sort of like what. Um, what types of diseases are trying to combat in terms of like where the investments are going or like, or forecast in the future of where you think the investments will be like, um, you know, if it doesn't have to be necessarily specifically to your company, but in, in maybe in biotech in general. Yeah, I think, um, you know, biotech, a lot of biotech companies, uh, specifically uh, the one I work for, they're really investing into oncology, into cancer therapeutics. Um, so that's really big. So traditionally, we were a, an HIV company, right? Um, Gilead's portfolio was, was mostly based on HIV, um, hepatitis, 
uh, as well as um, a, a few other things, but they're really now um, driving the focus to oncology. Um, and, and, you know, all there's so many different types of, of cancer. Uh, how, do you, um, how do you combat all of those different things? And then if you're able to, you know, if you find one formula, one secret sauce that works for uh, X type of cancer, how can we then use that, you know, baseline and try to make it effective for another type of cancer, right? And so there's so many different types of cancer that I think you're seeing a lot of money uh, flow into oncology across the board, not just um, at my firm, but I think all biotechs are really starting to, to turn their uh, attention to therapeutics um, in, in oncology. But I was curious, just to, you know, to the extent you're aware, like if the, in autoimmune disorders, I know like, at least from my personal experience, I'm not, this isn't my background. So uh, <laughs> from my personal experience, like, so it sort of seems like lupus is like pretty common um, in the, the Portuguese community. So I'm curious if you, if any sort of like those kind of like uh, disorders or immune, um, you know, concerns, diseases, um, if, if you've seen any of that, if not, I'm just, just curious. Yeah, no, I haven't, I haven't really seen any, anything like that. Um, I'm sure there is some um, biotech company that, that is looking into an autoimmune um, or, or growing their autoimmune portfolio, right? Uh, in, in, in the space that I know, uh, we don't have anything really um, along those lines. Okay. And then so just the mechanics of like what, what it is you do like on a, on a daily basis, right? Uh, can you kind of walk us through, like you're on the phone with everyone from every other country, like, like just give us kind of a just typical day. Yeah, so we, so, what I work, I work with a lot of the engineers who work on, um, you know, packaging products, um, creating the actual um, formula of the of the drug, whether it's a, a liquid or a solid uh, pill, for example, right? And so I work with them to understand uh, what are their budgetary needs, right? So if they're if we're launching a new product, for example, uh, I don't know an HIV treatment, right? They're going to need uh, a line like a, a plant line right to produce the, the product then they're going to have to take that product ship it somewhere else um, in maybe a barrel right to then have it packaged and so my day-to-day -day is working with them uh, to understand the needs of their product uh, their projects and for the projects uh, for the products that they're working on um, how much money do they need are they going to be uh, under budget over budget and then, so we take all of that information and we have to report that upwards uh, within our finance organization, right? And then those numbers end up getting, you know, called out when the company does like an earnings call, right? And so we have to be able to tell the story. And so it's not just, you know, putting the budget together, uh, tracking and, and watching that. You have to understand um, the line of business that you're working with because you have to be able to tell a story. Right. So, OK, yeah, this project's over 200,000 or 200 uh, or two million dollars over budget, for example. Right. Well, why? Right. It's easy to just say yes. But to have the connection with the engineers who are working on um, on these products, that's what the senior leadership wants to hear. Right. So why is this happening? Well, you know, product that we're getting from X country is is uh, is in high demand. And so the prices are higher or. We did a test batch and it wasn't a successful batch. So we had to throw that entire batch out and that's three, 400, 500, I don't know, right? It could be significant amounts of money. So we have to be able to tell that story uh, as well as put the numbers together uh, for our senior leadership so they can make decisions um, on the strategic uh, direction of the company. It sounds like an incredible job and incredible opportunity, but also very difficult. So have there been any lessons that you got growing up from your parents or you mentioned you live with your Um, Did anyone like, you know, in, in your family provide some like good old Portuguese wisdom that's helped you get through those challenges every day? Um, I, I would say the thing that was kind of instilled in me as a, as a kid was always just basic, just hard work, you know, um, that, nothing is going to, no one's going to come and give you anything just because you're, you're special, you know, um, you're going to have to go there and, and you're going to have to work. Um, I remember, um, uh, well, my dad used to say this to me, it was regarding soccer, but, uh, it applies, I think in, in 
in business, you know, uh, but he would say in Portuguese before the games, Tens que comer relva. like you have to be willing to get your hands dirty, you know, um, to, to get the job done. And so I think that's uh, in any job that you do, uh, you have to be willing to put in the work, uh, struggle. It's, it's, I mean, it's, these four months have not been easy at all. You know, it's been a lot of learning for me. Um, I still am learning, as I mentioned, and I'll be learning for, for obviously a very long time, but um, just continue to work uh, because that's the only way you can, you're going to be successful, right? Is, is putting in the time, putting in the effort. It's, there's no magic uh, solution to, to learning all of these different things, right? And um, I think that from my childhood, that, that's something that has helped me along my career um, before this current position and, and certainly now. I'm curious if you, like, if you took any, like, what sort of strength or if it inspired you at all, like, um, you know, having seen like, well, not having seen because you weren't born yet, right? So, but like to have, you, you know, your parents sort of like came from Portugal to Canada. And then, so you're making this jump from Canada to the US. Like for me, I, you know, every time I think about sort of the immigrant experience, I'm, I'm just constantly like, how did they do this? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, like, that's crazy to me. Like, you, it has to, you have to be a little bit unbalanced to just like, I'm going to take all these kids and we're going to go. Like, you know what I mean? This kind of thing. Like incredibly inspiring, but also just like beyond my sort of comprehension um, as far as like, you know, <laughs> level of difficulty. And so I'm curious for you, like, if you ever, like, if that was something that you're like, well, they did it, I, you know, I'm, I'm gonna make it work. They made it work, you know what I mean? You know, exactly what you said, that that went through my head and, and in tough times still does today, you know? Um, I think about it like, look, they, they leaving Canada was not easy because I had to leave my family and my friends to kind of pursue something that I wanted. Right. Um, and it was t times where I was just like, listen, like you really got to do this. You know, you're so comfortable here. Uh, you got everything you need kind of thing. Uh, your family, friends, you have a network here. Um, but then I thought I would always think to myself the same, like, what if, our parents, our, you know, grandparents didn't do that. You know, our lives may be very different than, than they are today. Right. And, and maybe we'd be in Portugal and, and we'd be okay, but um, it would be very different. And so the, I use that as, as a motivational uh, thing for myself I was like, they took a risk, right? Like they took a risk uh, for future generations of, of their family, because a lot of them weren't going to reap the benefits um, that that we're reaping today right like a lot of them came here to work hard labor jobs um doing the things that nobody else wanted to do so that uh, us three could go to business school law school work in biotech work in law you know like do all these different things um and so that inspired me to uh to have the strength to kind of push forward on what i knew i wanted to do uh whereas you know when you're there trying to make that decision it's it's easy to kind of just say, you know what, I'll do it later, or I won't do it at all. Uh, you know, calling on their experience inspired me to kind of push myself forward and, and, and take the steps that I did. Man, I really, really relate to that. Like, whenever I'm stressed, whenever I feel overwhelmed, I think like, man, this is, you know, A, this is probably nothing compared to what my grandparents and my great grandparents felt, but B, like, I can do it. And I, and I have to do it. Like, I have to keep working. I have to keep pushing because that was what they came here for. Like, you know, you almost feel like you're going to let them down if you don't, which I know is like a lot of pressure. Right. Uh, but I mean, obviously, I think I think this generation is rising to that challenge in so many ways. Like everyone we interviewed really highlights that. Yeah. And I think it, like you say, you know, you almost have that the obligation to try, you know. Yeah. It, it, we don't know what the, the outcomes of, of everything that we're doing today is going to, you know, if it's going to be a good decision, a bad decision, but we have the obligation, I think, to honor their efforts um, to at least give it our shot, you know, give it our best go, take on, take the, take risks for ourselves that we think are going to, are going to be good because they, uh, they made that ultimate sacrifice uh, really leaving, not even speaking this, like I came from the U S or Canada to the U S like speak the same language, 
you know, we use more or less the same money, you know, uh, everything's kind of, everything's, the cultures are pretty similar, um, depending on where you go in, in the U S and Canada. Right. And, and I found out hard. they, they, they did something completely they went across an ocean, uh, to a place that, you know, I, I, I came to the U S multiple times before I lived here, you know, they, they came one shot and there was no getting back on that plane and going back there, right? Right. There was so, no FaceTime. There were no cell phones. You know, it was really hard to stay connected the same way that we were able to now. For sure. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I think like you said, you know, it's that it is a, some some bit of a pressure, but I think it's a good pressure, motivational pressure, or at least uh, for me it is, and uh, an obligation for us to, to try as, as uh, you know, this new generation here in, in this part of the world. I love it. Um, so I want to make sure, I know, I know, you know, we're sort of coming up close to the end, but uh, I want to make sure to get this in there because obviously, you know, you're still working in finance. You started off at a bank. Um, you know, we try to do a little bit of financial literacy, a little bit to the extent that we can on this podcast. Uh, we recently spoke to someone, you know, sort of about 401ks and that kind of thing. Um, I'm curious for you, if you think if there's any one, I would say like um, misconceptions that you see about either financial literacy or just finance in general in, inside the Portuguese uh, community, whether it be, you know, Portuguese Canadian or Portuguese American. And then, you know, too, like what financial like tips do you think like um, people could most benefit from, um, you know, in your experience, if it's specific to, to our community or just young people in general? Yeah. Um, you know, my experience at the bank, uh, opened my eyes a lot to, in terms of the Portuguese community and, and finances in general. Um, Portuguese people are, it's interesting because what we just spoke about was the risk they took to, you know, come across the ocean to, to start a new life here. And the amount of Portuguese people that I saw when I was working at the bank that were just unwilling to take any risk in terms of their financial portfolios. Um, the, the, I met with so many clients and, the amount of times I've heard, um, passerinho na mão é melhor do que voar, right? Uh, they would sit on cash for decades. A lot of them legitimately sitting on cash, like stuffing it under their mattress, you know, because they would work side jobs. And, you know, so for the Portuguese community, I think it's very important. Um, and because I met a lot of their kids, you know, that were in their 30s. Uh, in their 20s that were had the same kind of uh, mindset of we're going to be very conservative. I don't I don't want to put this into the market um, because I could lose it all. Like that's not realistic, right? You're not going to lose it all by by being invested in the market. Um, you know, there's risk to your capital, of course, especially in the short term. But the the thought of you know the stock market's going to close and you're going to lose all your money overnight. Like that's not going to happen. Right. And um, I think that's set back the Portuguese community in Canada. And I, I would be interested to know how that is in the U S but I think that set back the community, that type of mentality. Um, because I mean, if you look at how much money was lost, uh, the economic opportunity um, in our community that was lost just from decades of, um, you know, not, and again, it's, they, they didn't have the, the level of education to make those decisions and probably, um, you know, they'd go to the bank and someone would speak to them in English and they didn't know what they were saying. And, you know, it just kind of snowballed on and on. Um, I think that's a big thing for the Portuguese community is um, hopefully our generations and, and forward can increase their financial literacy, um, take intelligent risks in terms of their portfolio, uh, and, and that would help lift our community economically. I know in, in Canada, um, that's, that's a struggle for the Portuguese community, you know, uh, relative to some of the other immigrant communities is that we got, you know, um, bogged down in these labor jobs and just put your money away, go to work, come home, you know, and, and didn't really. Yeah, so I think that that for sure is, um, is one big thing. And then uh, and the second part of the question was, I think you asked, you know, just some general financial advice, um, maybe for, for people our age. Uh, I think for me, I, I think the thing that hurts uh, people are our generation the most um, is this 
for whatever reason, and, and I guess it's just a social pressure uh, to try to, um, you know, compete with uh, friends that they have or, or relative or teammate or whatever, where you think like, oh, this person has, you know, the newest iPhone 13 and next year they're going to have 14. So I need to go buy that. Right. Um, and really, just, I think that constant competition um, causes people to make really bad financial decisions. Um, and, and, and that really hurts your ability to save, right? So if you're constantly looking for the new, the newest gadget when the one you have is perfectly fine, I think that's the number one thing that I saw um, in young people who weren't able to save was, was 100% always just like, they had a, you know, 2018 Honda Civic, they needed the 2020 Honda Civic. And they had the iPhone 13, they need the iPhone 14, they need the new Mac, you know, and these are just thousands of dollars. And so if you can really um, live within your means, obviously, but make decisions on, on needs and not necessarily um, just these desires and wants that we see on social media and, you know, celebrities having the newest thing, like that will, that's, a, that's the number one way I, I've seen uh, how you're going to kill your portfolio and, and not have financial success. That's so it's so interesting to hear you talk about sort of lack of risk because I this is something I you know I'm not in the finance world but I feel like I've spoken a lot about this to you know to family and friends and you know the thing that like in some ways like I feel like I have been able to achieve what I have achieved whatever little I have achieved in my life is like this mentality of like the hard work right so it's almost to the point where it's like a trope for Portuguese people right this is the hard work uh, you know, keep your head down, keep grinding. You know what I mean? And then I think, but, but there's like a level to it where it's like, you know, if your head's in the sand, right. And you're missing these opportunities. Um, you know, and I think a lot of times if you're coming from a, you know, sort of a blue collar background, like you're not necessarily aware that this is what's, what's taking place. You're just like, I'm working hard. I remember my first office job. That was like, that was me. I'm sitting there. I'm like working hard, I'm working hard. And I remember the supervisor kept coming over and saying, uh, you know, like, oh, how's it going? You know, I'm like, it's going. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> sort of doing my thing. Looking back to work. Real, right. Really, really young. I'm like, I'm working. Like, yeah. that's that's what my parents taught me to do. You know, you're at work, you're working. That's it. Like, as opposed to like, okay, no, like she wants to check in. I don't, I'm not aware of this sort of dynamic. Right. And it's something that like you have to sort of retrain yourself because you're not in those spaces. And I think, you know, it speaks very much to to finance as well. Like uh you know, obviously work hard, you may earn money, but, you know, just, just saving, um, you know, maybe that's, maybe it has held us back from sort of developing sort of generational wealth. Um, but yeah, no, that, definitely. I think if you look at, um, you know, if you're just sitting, I'm not even talking about adding money to, but if you just sit on, you know, say 10 grand uh, for 30 years in like a basic savings account, right? Like, okay, now rates are, are, ridiculously low, but historically they weren't as bad. But I mean, if we just look at 30 years of that versus 30 years in like a moderate portfolio, uh, balanced portfolio, nothing high risk, like the, the, the difference there would be just incredible, right? When you look over a 30 year career, right? And taking a little bit of risk, you know, a lot of these people could have been doing these hard labor jobs maybe 10 years uh, less than what they had to, you know, there's a lot of people that are working in, in Canada, you know, Portuguese people that are like 65 years old, you know, hard labor construction jobs, like their hands are just broken at this point. Like they, you know, and um, if they can help themselves a little bit um, through investing, through taking some risks, uh, the quality of life, your economic development, the, the future generations are going to prosper significantly more. I wonder if too that that kind of you know taking that big risk of coming across the ocean but then being averse to taking more risk comes from a sense of like feeling a little bit like an outsider like a newcomer i know for my grandparents it always you know sometimes they're distrustful of people who don't right. speak portuguese or outside of the community don't so rock the boat yeah right. exactly <laughs> That's, it's right it's been so important to have like portuguese bank and like we have one in montreal too my dad actually worked there when he was in college and it's so crucial that like they can find people that they trust because that's the way to get them to like break out of that shell. Um, 
thankfully, I think with our generation, it's a little bit different because we're much more integrated. Of course, like we talked about earlier, that comes with its own challenges. But, you know, I wonder if, if people like you who are really bridging these divides are, are really helping us get to that point. Yeah, I, I would hope so. That, that was that was my motivation in working at the bank was, you know, I know I'm not going to convince someone who has never done this in their life to, to change their radically their entire portfolio. But if I could get them to, you know, take 5% of what they, you know, would sit on in cash and say, you know what, let's just try this. Even if it's just 5% of what they got, you know, let's just try this and just get their mentality a little bit more open to that. Um, the trickle down to their family, uh, to their kids. And, and that could hopefully make a difference. Right. Um, but I, I think you're right. You know, it, it comes down to trust. Like, can they trust someone? A lot of times they're like, you know, uh, oh, no, I don't get problems with Google. I don't want any problems with the government. Right. Like we think <laughs> the money in this thing, like the government's going to come because they're making too much money on their, on their money in the bank. And it's like, you know, that's just, it takes time. Right. And, and, um, and it, it's hard. So hopefully it, it improves in our generation. I think it will. And I think it is improving. Um, but we'll get there. Thanks. Thanks so much, Michael. That's all the questions I have. I don't know if Andrew, if you want to add anything. Yeah, I think, I think it's conversation. actually a great note to wrap up on kind of a positive forward looking approach. So thank you so much for taking the time with us today. And we're really looking forward to this episode being out. Yeah, thank you. It was, um, it was great to be here. And, and I think what you guys are doing is, is great with this podcast and uh, good luck. I hope it keeps going and growing um, and uh, I'll, I'll keep listening. And um, if I can ever be of any assistance to, to either the podcast or to, to anything else in, in Palkis or, or what you guys are doing, I'm happy to help. And, and if there's anyone um, who's listening or anyone that you guys know that um, needs, uh, you know, networking or anything like that, that I can be of any assistance, um, please reach out and, and I'm happy to do so. Love you for saying that. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for joining us on this week's Palkus's Next Gen. This week's podcast was brought to you by Palkus, the Portuguese American Leadership Council of the United States. You can find this episode on iTunes, palkus.org, Amazon Music, and any place where podcasts can be found. The Next Gen logo is designed by Silveira Designs. This podcast is produced by Aaron Homem, with post-production by Scott Donnell of Run and Drum Media and original theme music by Pedro H. Da Silva.